Hello and welcome to another bicycle video. This video is on safety and this is the advanced course in safety. This is safety after you've learned the laws of the road and all the all the practicality of riding. This is the safety that's going to keep you from crashing and it's going to help you if you do crash. Now of course with with safety the the idea is not to crash. So I don't really understand this new thrill with staring uh, danger in the in the eye by exceeding speeds that you can't control. Uh, if anything goes wrong with, with, while you're doing your 50 mile an hour downhill, if a deer steps out or or you hit a gravel, you come around, there's a parked stalled car. Anything goes wrong at all when you're over your control skill level, then things are going to go really bad. And I don't understand this I mean if that's why you want a bicycle for the thrill of the danger then okay but then this video isn't for you this this video is about getting some good exercise having a good level of fitness and health and health can't be had when you're always crashing into things because you've exceeded the level that you can control a bike so the basic underlying theme of this whole safety video is control. And we're going to be discussing uh, the safest way to, uh, to brake and to go in turning and uh, safety checks on a bike, mechanical. We'll be going through a lot of things here and we're going to be going through them very quickly. So. Uh, you may want to stop the video to see my position on a bike at certain points as, a, as the video goes by because uh, I've used slow motion in a video but still things are happening pretty fast. So you may want to go back and stop the video and get a better look at my position and what I'm trying to explain. So can, is bicycle safety uh, boring or it can be exciting? Is it fun? I think it's I think it's fun when you train yourself to be uh, to be better than what you were by building skill sets by building strength. So this is a uh, this is a video for people who really want to learn how to be safe. And you know any sport can be dangerous. I don't consider cycling a dangerous sport because I don't push the limits. I don't uh, ride out of control. And for me, it's been a very rewarding, lifelong, very safe sport. Now, I could have rode differently and made it a very dangerous sport. And uh, I think that's the difference. And when you look at statistics and you see uh, the amount of accidents, we have to take into account that this is a statistic of everybody that's on a bicycle. That doesn't mean that they're skilled cyclists. That means they, they could be... Um, a lot of a lot of these people are using bicycles for transportation because they're they lost their license to drive because they're alcoholics and if you're drunk and you're on a bike and you're riding at night that accounts for almost 40 percent of the bicycle accidents right there so i consider cycling a very safe sport but you need to do work to make the safe a uh, sport safe just like you would any sport if you're scuba diving that's a safe sport if you do the work to make it safe skiing downhill skiing any any sport you pick even running as simple as running is or even hiking if you're not watching where you're placing your feet if you're not somewhat aware of what's going on around you eventually you're going to step off the edge of the pavement or place your foot on a rock that twists your ankle and and uh, and you could have a fall so I, I consider cycling as safe as any sport, but this video is going to make it very safe for you if you follow these guidelines and build up more strength in your upper body and a more higher skill set by practicing these techniques. So let's get started. We're going to start off with a bicycle safety check. Uh, you don't have to do all of this every day, but there are things you should do 
every day. Uh, this first one, we're going to drop the bike and listen for rattles. You're going to pick the bike up and just let it drop about three to four inches, and the bike should not be making any rattles. Then we're going to check the brake pull, uh, the brake lever pull, and uh, find out, make sure that there's very little pull between full stop and and neutral on the brakes. Then we're going to spin. After we check that, we we spin the wheels for trueness, and uh, and if the uh, if the wheels are true, they won't stop while you spin. So here we are bouncing the bike, checking for rattles. Now I'm checking the brake lever, brake lever pull. Run the bike, watch the front and rear wheels. They're spinning free. So wheels are true, brakes are good, no rattles. Gonna get some water for the long haul today. The next bicycle safety check is the uh, for for the um, more inexpensive bikes, bikes under a thousand dollars. A lot of these still use a a tapered crank, and I've found these tapered cranks to uh, to loosen up fairly quickly. Actually, of all the bolts on the bike, this is the one bolt that seems to loosen up almost every day. So this should be a daily check for you too. So we're going to. We have a specially, about a special large Allen wrench for this. And I'm going to just check to make sure that these cranks are tight and seated. And next, we're going to just check the, uh, check the mirror. I suggest everybody ride with a mirror. It's a very strong suggestion. I would never go out for a ride without a mirror. A mirror is, rear view mirror is so important that I simply wouldn't ride the bike without it. So in this part, we are just checking for the cleanliness of the mirror because if, if you get the mirror in sunlight and it's dirty, you won't be able to see anything. So it's just a cleaning of the mirror and then check for the tightness to make sure it's not gonna rattle loose. Now the mirror I do suggest is, this one I have on here now is the um, third eye mirror and I find uh, that's probably the only one that's going to work for you. Next we're going to do, uh, do a tire check. We're, uh, we're going to check both tires. We're going to look for tire wear. There's no tire wear indicators but we're looking for wear wear uh, the cord would actually start to show through and I'm looking for any objects that might be embedded in the tire but didn't didn't go all the way through and cause a flat and then I'm checking the quick release with a quick little bounce of my fist on there to make sure there's no rattles on the and the wheels mounted safely Next, we're going to do a bicycle check that's uh, checking the importance of the steering. Uh, to check the steering, you apply the front brake and then you rock the back bike back and forth. If the, uh, if the headset bearings are loose in the steering, you'll hear and feel a looseness in the headset. And it, and it needs to be adjusted then. So here I'm, I'm going to grab the front brake rock the back bike back and forth and check for looseness and then I'm going to pick the bike up and make sure the, that the uh, the whole front fork wheel set moves smoothly. Next because the steering system is so important we're going to be checking for loose bolts in the handlebar system so just a quick check of the tightness of the bolts here there are torque values on these if you and uh, if you're not uh, really familiar with tightening bolts you probably don't have that feel in your hand and you may want to invest in a torque wrench 
but basically we're just looking for loose bolts just so there's no surprises on the ride today next on the si uh, bicycle safety check we are checking for loose bolts on the seat post there's there's usually only two bolts here you have the seat post binder bolt you don't want that to come loose on the ride otherwise the ride won't be very enjoyable and then the I don't check these very often because uh, these rarely loosen up next I'm going to uh, go into the tools that you need to take on the road with you um, to go out on the road and uh, and not have these tools and you get a flat or or an important bolt comes loose or you break a spoke and now the wheels out of true and it's rubbing on the uh, and it's rubbing on the tie on the uh, brake pads also a uh, patch kit to back up the tube just in case you have more than one flat and uh, nowadays I carry two tubes because the uh, the tube quality has gotten so bad that the uh, the valves can't be trusted anymore so now I carry two tubes and a and a patch kit for repairing so here in this picture is my set of tools from uh, left to right across the top we're, we're going to see the air pump the little T wrench there it has three different size Allen wrenches that's an extra bolt for my bottom bracket uh, below that is the little square patch kit that is uh, two uh, glueless spoke wrench and a funny looking wrench on the bottom left is the chain tool and then the three tire levers for removing tires you don't see the extra tube but I do carry two tubes now and here's my alternate set of tools this is um, where I bought the uh, combination tool so it's the same set we got two uh, patch kit carrying extra money and then this uh, multi-tool which has a built-in chain tool in it and a bunch of wrenches this will get you out of this is well this has gotten me out of trouble pretty much my entire life of 50 years of riding next is just a quick note that uh, most all of this safety stuff we're talking about today doesn't work when the bike doesn't fit you so please refer to some of my other videos for proper bike fit because without proper bike fit you can't do about 90 percent of what i'm presenting today so as i said the theme of this video is controlling your speed and we don't want to exceed our line of sight where we can control so as I go around this corner I need to break down to a speed where if there is something that I can't see a deer coming out you know I got a bunch of stuff here depends on where you live I don't know if Flor Floridians see alligators on the road or not and I don't know if uh, the great uh, Midwest sees see buffalo out there but uh, out here in California we certainly do see our deer our squirrels uh, uh, rabbits um, a lot of wildlife out there and besides that we have a we also have a truck here that's stalled and it's and it's parked on as far over on the shoulder as possible what you're seeing here is the field of vision and uh, the brown area is the uh, is the cliff that or the mountain that's obscuring your vision around the corner if you live in an area where you can where there's a curve and it's unobstructed then of course there's no problem but usually if there's a curve if there's a reason and um, there are obstructions either trees a fence something uh, so we're trying to ride in control so when we come around the corner if there's a rock slide or there's gravel on the road we want to be at a speed where we can stop so the first part of safety and the first thing you should do if you have a new bike is the first thing you do is you you go down the you go out into a nice safe area like a bike trail or a, or an empty parking lot early in the morning and you go out and you and you just test the brakes 
every bike is different. In fact, when you change brake shoes, the bike may be different. And, uh, and as the brake shoes wear, the bike is different. But that, that you get used to because of the slow wear. But we're going to... Braking is one of the most important skills to learn on a bike. And what people... A lot of people don't realize is on, on these bikes, 70% uh, of the work is being done by the front brake. Because as you brake and your weight shifts forward, it takes weight off the rear wheel. And eventually, the rear wheel will skid long before the front front tire will skid. So here we are going into our first fast emergency stop. So what we're practicing here is emergency stopping. So here we are slowed down. You, uh, you can stop the video at any time and look at my position on the bike. You'll find my position is pulled back my, that's why my arms are straight. My position is pulled back so I, so I take as much weight moving forward off the front tire and I can brake heavier with my front wheel. Here's a longer distance look at the, at the, at the time where I apply the brakes and when I stop. Next we're going to be moving into braking in the corners which takes, uh, takes more skill than the, than the uh, flat straight stopping uh, going in the, once you've mastered and gotten a really good emergency stop working for you when you're going in a straight line the next is to is to um, practice that in corners now of course with all this braking practice you're going to start at slow speeds and once you got that you're going to go faster and faster and faster and faster and you're going to practice stopping at faster and faster speeds. And the same thing goes for, especially for corners. You want to begin your speed slow and uh, work up to a to a to a, what you normally would be at what your normal speed would be at when you want to do an emergency break in a corner. Now the the controlling your speed of course is part of setting up the corner. So with uh, going into corners, we're talking, it's not so much the 70, 30% braking as it is on the flat. Now it's more of an even braking. If you're, if you're already, if you're trying to stop while in the corner, you'll, you'll have to, uh, you'll have to ease off on the brakes. It'll take a lot more distance to stop. So here I am setting myself up. I'm breaking to a safe, my safe cornering speed, and then I see an obstruction, and I have to come to a stop, and I and I make my braking stop. So let's uh, let's see that in uh, slow motion here. I'm coming into the corner. And I don't know that there's an obstruction where I'd have to make an emergency stop. So, I've, so I'm only braking to my normal cornering speed, whatever, whatever my skill level is for this, for this cornering speed. And as I go into the corner, then I notice, okay, we, we do have an obstruction. I need to come to a complete stop. And here I'm doing my emergency braking. And coming to a complete stop in a corner. You'll need to practice this uh, quite a bit until you get proficient. But this is this is a very good thing to learn. Now, controlling speed on on all these have been dry condition uh, braking. Controlling your speed and braking on wet conditions is completely different. You, you, you just base, I just basically assume that there's oil or there's something in the road that's going to be slippery. So when I going when I'm going into corners on a wet on wet pavement, uh, I am braking heavily before I get to the to corner so that I can go through the curves pretty much with a perpendicular bike where I don't have to lean it into the corner. 
I'm not going to take the chance that there's that there's something mixed with the water that's going to make uh, icy conditions even in even in 90 degree weather. If uh, if it's a new rain and it hasn't rained in a while, just the new rain mixed with the pavement oils will make for very slippery conditions. If a car has dropped oil or coolant, radiator fluid, radiator fluid and oil mixed with the water makes it exactly the same as a, a hockey rink ice. So that's why when riding in, in uh, wet weather, I'm not, I'm not in a hurry to go anywhere. Next is the mirror skills. Not using mirrors, and I don't understand why not. Um, as the beginning of video, you saw the mirror on my bicycle. It's uh, very unobtrusive, doesn't get in the way, and it's always there when you need it. So with mirror skills, the mirror allows you to do a lot of things that you couldn't do without it. For one, you'll after using a mirror for a while, you're going to be able to judge car speeds as they come up behind you, and you're going to be able to judge whether this car is going to wait on you when there's oncoming traffic, or if it's going to try and pass you in between. And uh, everybody knows what that's like, being on a narrow road, having oncoming traffic, a car coming up behind you, and you on the road, and everybody coincidentally meeting there at the same time. So the mirror gives you the advantage of looking back and knowing if the, if the car is going to do that. And uh, for me, if a car is going to do that on a narrow road, I'm not going to stay on the road while all these cars are passing me within inches from me. I will look to the shoulder and look for a way to pull off the road and let these cars pass me by. Uh, with the mirror, with all mirrors, you have blind spots. But with a bicycle, as the mirror, as the car passes through the blind spot, just a quick turn, a little turn of your head to the left and out of your peripheral vision, you'll see, you'll see where the car is. You'll see if the car pulled in on you, which would be very rare that they pulled back in you in that little time slot between your blind spot and where they've completely passed you. So this is one of the advantages of, of the mirror. Another advantage of the mirror is this little technique. When you're on a narrow road, and even if there's not oncoming traffic in the other lane, sometimes I've noticed on certain roads, certain parts of town, certain areas of the country, you, know, you just get mean drivers and they don't want to pull over. They want to stay right in your lane and give you absolutely no extra space. So here's a little technique that works perfectly. And you can only do this with a mirror. So on the left, side of, on the left road on this illustration you see the cyclist and this uh, the white line this is not a bike lane the white line down the down the right side of the road that's a fog line not the dividing line for a bike line and the side and the black pavement to the right of the fog line is just the shoulder so uh, cyclist isn't even supposed to ride in the shoulder except to let let cars pass so normally you're not riding in the shoulder so here we have the cyclist riding oh maybe 12 to 12 to 20 inches to the left of the fog line in the regular traffic lane being perfectly legal now when cars are passing too close when you're out this far and you're not allowing the car enough room to actually squeeze through between you and the center line what happens is the car is forced to slow down thinking that you're not going to move but what's going to happen is, as, as you view the car coming up in your rearview mirror, as they get closer and closer, now look at the slide to the, the, the roads to the, to the right on this slide. The cyclist has moved onto the shoulder. So now you've waited for the car to move around you, but you've actually moved over to the right another 20 to 30 inches. And now you've given yourself an extra three feet more than what you normally would have had by just riding right on the line or riding on the shoulder. This is a very good technique for giving yourself more room when when cars are not being very very kind to you. The next technique is to learn to ride in a straight line. And this goes alongside 
what we just discussed, and that's when a car is coming up beside you in your blind spot, a little turn of your head to the left to check where the car is is always a good idea. But this is a technique you have to learn because when you turn your head to the left, the bike still needs to be going in a straight line. So this is a technique that needs, that needs lots of practice too. So if you can find a bike trail like this with a nice, dot, with a nice center line, you can practice going down the center line and turning your head to the left or the right and checking to see that you're not weaving off the line. So here in the slow motion you can see I'm pedaling the straight line and I'm not look and you still need to be viewing forward like you normally do. You're not you're not looking down at the wheel contacting the dotted line. So you need to practice this to hold a nice straight line because on the shoulder of the road you usually don't got that much room to be weaving around. And here's one more view of just looking around and holding a nice straight line. Next we're going to go into cornering. Um, these are these are again dry cornering um, dry cornering conditions. And we're going to start with the right hand turn, which is the easiest one because you get to control the entire road. As you make your right turn, you get to, you know, you see all the way down into the, into the shoulder of the road and all of that is yours. There's, there's not going to be any traffic in your way there. So on the right turn, you have the most control. So here I am setting up my speed for the turn, going into the turn, and completing the turn, but uh, I want you to observe the body position as I'm going through. What I'm doing is I'm getting low, keeping my center of gravity low, but I'm also got all my weight on the left pedal. I'm weighting the left side of the bike. You can stop the video if you need to. And uh, the bike is leaning, but my upper body is still being more per perpendicular to the road so that the gravity uh, remains uh, perpendicular and it offsets the the centrifugal force that would normally be pushing the bike to the left. Next we're going to be doing the corner in the left hand and the left hand is the pretty much the same as the right if you can if you have full visibility of the road if you can see oncoming traffic. If you can see oncoming traffic and there's no obstructions then you can use the uh, the full amount of your lane and you and go right out to the center lane to get the uh, to get the wi the widest or to get the straightest line through the curve but when there's obstructions like in here I can't see traffic coming so all I'm doing is paralleling the outside of the curve that's the only safe way to go through you don't want to be going through this curve not knowing what is coming up the other side of the road. So I'm not turning into... Now there's no center line on this road. There's only an imaginary road and it's a very narrow road. So there's no way I'm going to come into the center line. So I'm going to go through this... I'm going through this curve extra slow because I'm paralleling the, the curve. I'm not... Uh, I'm not going through this curve like you normally would. Next is cornering in the S turns. So in this one we're going to be doing a right turn and then a left turn and we're going to be shifting our body position and we're going to be shifting our weight and we're going to be turning the crank forward one half, one, one half rotation so that when I'm going through the right turn my left foot is, um, I got my left foot loaded with my body weight which is you know slightly picking yourself up off the saddle so that the saddle's not carrying the weight. I'm waiting the right pedal and then as I go through and I complete the right turn you'll see me shift over and I'll shift my weight move the pedal around and then I'll wait the other side so here I am coming in on the right switching my weight and going into the left turn so here we are in a slow-mo I've already set myself up here I've got my speed controlled. Now if you're if you're accelerating too much at this point, 
after you come out of the first right turn, you have a short distance here where you can really brake hard and control your speed for the next turn. Then we're going to shift weight, shift body position, and go into the left curve. The next is a uh, is a, it's not really a it's not really a skill. Um, in this video, I rode through debris on purpose while still holding the uh, normal curve, and it was after I did it, I felt stupid because it was a very dangerous thing to do. As soon as I hit the gravel, the uh, the gravel acts like ball, like uh, marbles in a road, and as soon as the tire hit the gravel, I started skidding. Uh, sideways. Um, I never, that's why again we're controlling our speed into corners so in this one we're setting ourselves up into our normal curve where we're, we're controlling our speed so if there's it's obstructions we can control our speed through the obstructions. So in this next video I'm coming through the corner here I'm controlling my speed I see the gravel and you'll see I turn straight into it. You'll see the bike is exactly perpendicular. We're going to I'm going to show this to you on an illustration here. This first illustration shows you where the the normal curve you would come from the outside of your lane on the left, go to the apex of the turn on the bottom, and then you and then uses a mux pavement on the outside of the turn. That gives you the most straight line through the curve where you can hold the most amount of speed and have the most amount of control. But as we entered this curve, we immediately noticed there was gravel on the road. So you'll see now there's elbows in my turn, really sharp elbows. So as I set myself up to the corner and I saw the gravel, I braked extra heavy during that first part of the curve and then I hit the elbow part. Now my bike isn't in a curved position anymore. It is, it is perpendicular to the road. It's not leaning. It's there's no centrifugal force. Now I can go through the gravel in a straight line, and as I get through the and I can and I'm also at a slower speed where I can pick my way through the gravel where I, I probably don't have to run over most of it unless it's very heavy. Once I made it through the gravel, I do another elbow quick turn, and I go back down the road. Now all of this is happening at a controlled speed. There's the one where I tried to hold that one I tried to hold my uh, hold my line on purpose. That's what I said a stupid thing to do to show in this video and I'm never gonna do it again. I started coming in a curve. I knew there was gravel there and I wanted to illustrate what happened and what happened was it started throwing my bike all over the place and I ended up going straight anyway. So go back and review that first one where I rounded off, or where I squared off the turn. And next we're going to be uh, the um, in-town intersections, the 90 degree turns, where, you know, everything's in town is pretty much 90 degree turns. So on this next one, it's pretty much the same technique as we just used on the curves. You can, under dry conditions, you control your speed into the intersection and if there's no obstructions, you can go through with the normal smooth curve and the normal lean of the bike. But as if you enter the intersection and there's debris, again we're going to use that uh, elbow turn. We're going to see the we're going to be at our controlled speed. We're going to hit our brakes uh, extra heavy now to really slow us down, so we can do these elbow type turns. So I can so I can do a straight line with a perpendicular bike that's not leaning, that has no centrifugal force pulling on it, and I can go through the gravel and obstructions without any danger. And of course, this works. This is what I use all the time for wet weather turns. Wet weather turns are always like this. Heavy braking while I'm going straight, and then a, and then a very nice smooth elbow turn, a straight turn 
and then I straighten it out into that 45 degrees to the to the corner and then another nice smooth elbow turn and going down the road so if there's any oil or or coolant or any of these things that grass even grass clippings that are wet can can become very very slippery there's so many things when you add water to the road so I just assume that all turns are has something in there that's going to be slippery because you can't see the oil and you can't see the coolant there can be so little of it that uh, it's still slippery but you can't see it and I've fallen enough enough times going through uh, corners that looked fine in wet weather and weren't and I went down so this is the technique for in in town and any kind of wet weather breaking and going in the corners next we're going to deal with acceleration this is a nice technique to learn to get you out of get you out of a trouble where uh, you might, maybe you're coming up to a to a car and you and you think and you look at the driver and, it, and you thought he saw you but now you notice he's pulling out but you're already at a point where you can't break and let them pull out if they're on the right you're in a right lane they're at an intersection and they're on the right side of you pulling st straight across from you if you're already past the point of return sometimes a quick get out of the saddle all one move and go into a sprint and you can uh, accelerate very quickly and get out of trouble this is also just a very good technique for you know getting out of the saddle is a very good technique with you know without sprinting just getting out of the saddle is a good technique for relieving pressure on your on your uh, on your bottom while you're riding uh, it's also a, a nice alternative for when you're climbing and there's many and there's basically three different positions you can use while gently using the out of side uh, out of saddle position but in this video we're going to be doing the quick from seated there I go right into a standing position this is a very very quick move from seated to standing here's another view of it from straight on it's hard to see sideways other than the lifting of the saddle but here I am in the seated position and boom there I go into the sprint position the standing position is the only way to really accelerate hard you can't ex no one can accelerate very hard while staying in the seated position unless your skill level in the standing position is is uh, very poor and here it is in slow motion as I go into the standing position there's a lot of technique here you can see me shifting my weight from side to side so I'm using the weight of my body I've got my arms bent but locked so that I'm pulling on the handlebars and I'm also pulling back up with my hamstrings on the back using everything I have in my body to power through next is a nice little skill called bunny hopping it's a way of picking up your bike and jumping over objects while you're riding it's another very high skill thing that takes lots of practice I've jumped squirrels this way um, and saved the squirrel's life uh, anything bigger than a squirrel is going to be pretty tough to jump you're not going to be able to jump a rap raccoon or a rabbit but uh, I've saved lots of squirrels lives this way but the biggest thing is is you know when you're surprised by something maybe you know maybe you were viewing the scenery and saw you know got a little caught up in the scenery and when you look back all of a sudden well all of a sudden there was a uh, a big old chuck hole so here we are chuckle that chuckle is about 15 inches wide and you just saw me jump it with a bunny hop here it is in slow motion you can see I cleared I cleared the entire hole with one pull up on the bars and a pull up on on the pedals now this does not work without being clipped to the pedals you have to have toe clips or clipless pedals to make this work um, I think there's some really high skilled riders that can do bunny hops without those but it uh, it's going to be much more difficult so here's a little help for practice what I got is a sheet rolled up making uh, uh, a sheet is very lightweight material and you can accidentally hit it with the bike with absolutely no danger 
So I got a sheet rolled up making for a, uh, an object that is uh, almost six inches above, above the surface. And I'm also practicing off-road here on grass. So the first way to learn this technique is to use just the front. Just practice picking up the front of the bike. And, you're, and this is not going to be like a wheelie where you're using the cranks to, to aid in it. This is going to be just picking up the bike with your arms. This is all upper body motion. And there we have the bunny jump. So the best way to learn this technique is to start first with just the front. And then when, you, when you've gotten good at picking the front up over the object and staying in a straight line, then you can practice hopping the rear over. Um, if you're a little uh, worried about picking the bike up like that, you can do this without moving. If you get two friends to stand beside you to, to uh, keep you upright, and then get in position and just use your arms and use your legs to yank the bike up off the ground. You want to get, the, you wanna get the, both the front tire and back tire up. Ideally, the, um, for the perfect bunny hop, you want the, the uh, front tire to be slightly higher than the rear. But with two people standing beside you, you can practice pulling the bike up and down. And then once you get comfortable with that, then try, try the little sheet technique and, uh, and pop your bike over. So there it is in slow motion with just the front wheel. Again, you can stop the video during the hop and see what I'm doing. Next, we're reiterating the control your speed. Here we are again, back with the same thing. This is the basics of all safety. Controlling your speed so that you can break for obstacles. Controlling your speed so that you're not um, going so fast that you can't control a bike. This is the basic of all safety beyond simple safety. Uh, one, one other technique when you're, this is the uh, steering onto the shoulder of the road where the, you're going from pavement to gravel or pavement to sand or whatever the surface is. Um, this is a judgment call. You're going to have to judge the surface. Now for mountain bikers, a lot of that judgment of of off-road surface is pretty good with them. But if you're just a road biker, judging the surface can be pretty difficult. But anyway, going from gravel, uh, if a car has to passed you too close and you've gone off the road into the gravel, this is the technique for stopping. You're going to use mostly the rear brake. If the rear tire spins, that's okay. I normally use this uh, rear brake and tire uh, not, not spinning, but the tire locking up. But here is a controlled stop with the rear brake. And I have my feet out because um, you never know how slippery this is. You can see it's on an angle. Next is the bike lanes, the good, the bad, and the ugly. People like them, people don't like them. I'm in one of those people that don't like them. I personally think they were made by a cyclist that spent six months on the road and said and decided we need bike lanes to be safe and uh, went to their government and unfortunately they got them. I don't personally believe bike lanes are safe at all. Uh, I had a better solution and I wish uh, they would have talked to me first. Would have saved a heck of a lot of money. We've spent billions of dollars now on on these bike lanes to extend the, to, to extend the width of the road, to paint the lines, to, uh, to add buttons at intersections, all kinds of stuff, just for a bike lane that really wasn't necessary. So here's the, here's the bike lane that I like, and that is the one that parallels the road but has a medium of 10, 12, 15 feet in between. It just parallels the road. This is the only safe bike lane that I know of. And the reason I don't like bike lanes is because, except for a few lanes, bike lanes that may be uh, right in town, most bike lanes in my, in my area do not get cleaned. They never get cleaned. And even a good hard rain won't clean everything off. 
So the trouble is, no matter what is debris is on the regular traffic lanes, the wind and the tires of the cars and trucks will eventually force all of the debris off of the main highway onto the bike lane, and that's where it stays. Um, you'll find that the uh, difference between the bike lanes and the normal driving lanes is the difference between a bunch of stuff you never want to ride your bike through and a perfectly clean road. You can throw a bottle of glass on a, on a driving lane and break it, and within a, within a week, all that glass will be all busted up and pushed over to the side. So the bike lane is basically just a shoulder and is taking all the shoulder debris. So now, when there's a bike lane, I am forced to use it or the car drivers get mad. And I end up riding through glass, nails, screws, sharp metal, sharp rocks, thorns, sand, gravel, low branches, trash cans, park cars, varmints, you know, er dead stuff, everything that gets, that's, Everything gets pushed off the road. Everything gets cleaned off the road and pushed onto the bike lane, and that's where it stays. Next is, not all bike lanes are the same width. So here we have a bike lane that's approximately twice the width of a cyclist, which is <laughs> way too narrow. Because what you end up with is everybody being legal. You have the car, very legal, right in the middle lane, right where it's supposed to be. Bicycle, very legal, right in the middle of its lane, exactly where it's supposed to be. But we have a passing distance that is much closer than what m most cars would allow anyway. Here we have a truck, and of course the truck takes up nearly the entire lane. Now the passing distance is, is like 15 inches between my mirror and the truck's mirror. People don't realize that on these pickup trucks that they're buying with the extended mirrors, that those mirrors stick out another 12 inches over their fender and they forget about that. And these trucks are actually driving their mirrors through the bike lane. So if you don't have a rear view mirror, I don't think there's much hope for you in these narrow bike lanes. You need to be watching your rear view mirror. Next is tailgating uh, autos and a bike lane. Tailgating and speeding are the two most dangerous things any motorist can do. You combine the two, which they normally do, and you end up with the most dangerous situation on the road. This tailgating and speeding by the motorists make them the most dangerous terrorists and the most dangerous faction of enemies that this country has ever known. Since 1950, automobiles have killed more people than all the wars combined since the Revolutionary War of 1700s. So I consider tailgaters, or anybody that disobeys the traffic laws on the road, to be terrorists, because these are the most dangerous people you're ever going to run into in your life. Next is the bike lanes that combine a sidewalk, a curb, a stretch of concrete that butts up to the pavement. Now we have a section of bike lane that's very narrow, but you can't even use the whole thing because now you have where the pavement meets the concrete, there's a crack or there is a raise. Either the pavement is higher or the concrete is higher as, as it's settled. It's never a perfect joint. So even if you have a fat tire of two inches, this joint is very dangerous and you have to stay away from it. If you have a one inch tire of a road bike, this joint is extremely dangerous and you can't ride over it. You can easily lose control by, by hitting this ridge. And I've known expert cyclists to hit these ridges and, and uh, crash and be out of control. So now we have a narrow bike lane, but we can't even use, in this picture, we can't even use a third of it because a third of it is concrete, and I, so now I'm forced to ride extremely close to the white line to my left, which even pushes me closer to cars. Another reason why bike lanes don't work. So in this last part of bike lanes, this was my suggestion, and that was no bike lanes. All we need is a, no, is a full passing law. 
In every state of this union, cyclists are considered a, a vehicle, and we are bound by all vehicle laws. We are bound to stop at stop lines, stop signs, stop lights. We do everything a vehicle does, but we are the only vehicle on the road that doesn't get a full lane when someone passes them. Motorcycles are, are no more wider, take, take up not much more space than a bicycle, yet they are entitled to a full lane when a car passes. So here we have the most unprotected vehicle on the road getting the least amount of protection from the law. If they would have just passed the full lane passing law, it would have only cost this country the ink in the pen. The ink in the pen is the only cost there would have been. There would have been no changes to the roads. The changes they did to the roads with bike lanes is now causing mass confusion because as the bike lane enters intersections with multiple lanes that have right turn lanes, left turn lanes, double, double left turn lanes, double right lanes, shared common fifth lanes in the center, it's a massive amount of confusion to the drivers because no one knows what to expect from you. To be legal, you need to leave the bike lane and use the right turn lane or left turn lane if those are available. But when you leave the bike lane to do that, you're going to anger about 50% of the cars because they think you, you're not allowed to do that. But that is the legal way. I think the simplicity of the uh, full passing law, like every other vehicle on the road gets, would have been the simple answer to this. There's not that many bicycles on the road. As I traveled to work, I would never commute to work, even when I lived in Portland, which was com considered the bicycle commuting capital of the world, or of the country. I would never compute, com uh, commute to work. I'm not gonna ride a bicycle on a very narrow bike line at the very height of traffic where people are trying to get to work on time and they're late. This is, the, and the most pollution in the air. This is the absolute worst time to be on the road. Heavy traffic, heavy pollution, narrow bike lanes, and I don't really understand it. Here I am a cyclist and I would never ride my bike to commute. I ended up, I took the buses and trains and walked and walk to work. A little quick thing on the pedals. I think I already mentioned this. Uh, the clipless and toe clips, uh, without being attached to the pedals, most of the safety things that I've mentioned here cannot be done very easily, and some of the stuff it may be impossible. So for those of you who think that being locked to the pedals is dangerous, I, I understand your fears, but uh, you'll find that no experienced cyclist will ride unattached to the pedals. So there must be something to this that every recreational cyclist, every racer in the world that has any experience at all is always attached to the pedals. And I, I, cer I certainly consider uh, being attached to the pedals a giant safety factor in my style of riding. When I'm going through rolling hills and I'm at a good speed, I will, uh, one of the techniques of going through rolling hills is you pedal down the one hill, hold pedal up the other side, holding good speed, and then as you get to the crest of the hill, you stand up and you sprint, or out of the saddle, sprint across the crest of the hills. It saves a lot of energy. With just a little jump like that, you can, you can get across the crest of the hills, hold all your speed, and, and then repeat again for the next hill. Well, I may be going 25 to 30 miles an hour when I crest these hills, and I would never attempt this unless I was locked very tightly to the pedals. Next we're going to go into the biggest thing that uh, everybody's going to write to me about and I'm going to try and make you understand what's going on. Uh, helmets, you know, you'll notice throughout this video going, this is a safety video and a guy doesn't have a helmet on. Well I had to make the decision. I don't wear a helmet when I ride. So I made, when I made this safety video I had to uh, had to decide whether to be truthful or to be deceptive. And truth to me is a very, uh, very dear to me and I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be deceptive. So I'm riding my bike like I normally ride my bike without a helmet. And for just probably for everybody riding, 
watching this video, you're going to need a helmet. Uh, for me, it became more dangerous to uh, wear a helmet than not to wear a helmet, and that's where I made my decision not to. There's a number of reasons for that, and one of the reasons is most people never train to crash. Nobody ever trains in crashing. And because they don't do that, and because they don't, most people don't train their upper body for strength either. They simply don't have the strength in their upper body, in their shoulders, and in their neck to hold their head off the pavement. When I see videos of people falling, all I see is their body just being, being crushed and absorbed right into the pavement, and everything just hits. Everything hits. They're not doing any, any way to, to lessen the blow of the pavement. And there are techniques to do that. Um, these people have to wear a helmet because when you fall, you are going to hit your head. Now, I've probably crashed over 100 times in the last 50 years, maybe more. I'm not really sure. I never kept track of it. But in that time, I've crashed. I've been able to protect my head. And one of the main reasons is because when I was very young, I took martial arts. And the first thing they taught us in martial arts was how to fall and how to, uh, how to fall and how to not have, uh, not absorb all of the uh, falling. It, it we've learned how to distribute the energy of the contact with the pavement. And uh, I encourage everybody to take one, at least one year of martial arts and learn how to fall. This is not just for cycling, this is for living. I mean, this this learning how to fall has, has saved me from injuries so many times that it, that uh, I can't even count. I can't even count how many times. For every time I crash, of course, there's a combination of this falling technique and I've always trained my upper body. Since I was, I don't know, since I was 18 years old or so, I've been, I've been training with weights. And... Uh, so in the off scene of cycling, I would go full time with weights. And uh, now, now as I get older, I uh, I'm full time with weights year round too. So I'm between the weights and the uh, and my kayaking. I I have a very strong upper body from from 50 years or 40 years of of uh, training. Now the strong upper body with the shoulders and the neck means I can fall, and I can hold my head out of danger and we're going to go into that right here i'm going to show you some tech there's the backwards fall i'm using my body and curling it to distribute the contact and then my arms keep my head from making contact with the pavement and in the side fall the arm does not try to block the fall it just slows down and i go into a curved arc again with my upper with my body to absorb the contact. And then, of course, in the forward, I'm going to do this slow first. In the forward fall, you do a roll. The forward fall is the most dangerous because uh, your head's going first. You know, you know, your head's leading your way to the pavement. And now I'm going to do a faster, more practical version of the forward fall and the roll out. And here it is from the back. Again, I'm showing you. You can see my, my head is almost six inches off the ground. It never even comes close to contacting the ground. In the backward fall, there's about four, three to four inches. Well, we're still in the side fall here. In the backward fall, there's about three or four inches. Now, if there was enough momentum in the backward fall, I would go ahead and distribute that and do actually backward somersaults. And with your head tucked in, the head will contact the pavement, but it will not contact it very hard. I've never actually had my head contact the pavement. And there is a full, a full fall in a forward position as if I went over the handlebars. Now that's a very fast thing to see, so I've given you a slow motion here. I would have done more of these, but uh, even though I've done this off this, this ground was as hard as pavement, and I'm bruising up my body very badly showing you these techniques. I'm not injuring myself with broken bones or head concussions, 
But uh, yeah, they're still getting bruised from this very hard ground. So here I am in a full, full speed drop. So that's it for bicycles, bicycle safety. I encourage you to use all these techniques and practice these until you get very good. And I certainly encourage you to uh, take some martial art classes to learn how to fall. The demonstrations I gave you on falling today are not lessons. Do not use these as lessons. You need to find a qualified martial artist teacher who is certified in teaching to teach you how to fall. They're going to teach you on nice soft mats <laughs> and you won't be getting bruised up like I am today. And that's it for today. Save cycling everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>